You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, episode 32, sonnet 31. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What if I say I'm not just another no. one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? We all know William Shakespeare from his plays, but relatively few people know much about his sonnets, which is sad because it was the only writing that he ever published, and its contents form the backbone for the rest of his magnificent body of work. If you're just listening into this podcast for the first time, welcome. While you could start this podcast at any episode, I do recommend checking out episode one just to get up to speed on the background and the framing. Happy 2020, everyone. I haven't published a podcast episode since the last decade. At the beginning of December, I left my day job in desperate need of some time off. Between long school holidays, investing in a very different kind of personal project and a job hunt, I really haven't had much time to focus on anything Bard related. Between juggling so many things and trying to arrange alternative ways to fund this project, the podcast has been left at a slightly lower priority, at least for the meanwhile. I can say that there is a new page for the graphic novel on the way, But this is in spite of the fact that support for this project has been dwindling and I've been taking on a lot more personally. Which is fine, but it makes for very slow going. If you're enjoying this podcast or the graphic novel so far, please consider contributing. This all takes a lot of effort and money, and I need your help if we're going to produce a quality piece of work in a reasonable amount of time. Regarding the book publishing, I finally succeeded in arranging the ISBNs and have spent an enormous amount of effort over the last week adding more sonnets, editing, formatting, and publishing. I've just uploaded the finished product to the Kindle and Google Play stores, and I'm hoping to get it onto Apple Books soon as well. To my patrons, I could never fully express my gratitude for your generous support and for showing faith in a project that I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. You play a crucial role in making this work, so thank you, Thank you, and thank you again. Sonnet 31 Thy bosom is endeared with all hearts, Which I by lacking have supposed dead, And there reigns love, and all love's loving parts, And all those friends which I thought buried. How many a holy and obsequious tear Hath dear religious love stolen from mine eye, as interest of the dead which now appear, but things removed that hidden in there lie. Thou art the grave where buried love doth live, hung with the trophies of my lovers gone, who all their parts of me to thee did give, that due of many now is thine alone. Their images I loved I view in thee, and thou, all they, hast all the all of me. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 31. Sonnet 31 has been identified as directly referencing a lover's complaint, in addition to following on logically from Sonnet 30, and it directly references Sonnet 24 with the words bosom and image. Thy bosom is endeared with all hearts, which I by lacking have supposed dead, and there reigns love and all love's loving parts and all those friends which I thought buried. In the late 16th century, endear was used to mean enhance the value of, or win the affection of, and in the original quarto text is spelled endeared, which suggests that the bosom, or chest, is made dear by containing the memories of the hearts, as well as being filled with affection for them. Heart, in Middle English, referred to significantly more than it does today. Heart, breast, soul, spirit, will, desire, courage, mind, intellect, and even memory. In addition to its modern-day meaning, lack also meant blame or fault. Supposed derives from the old French to assume, but literally means put or place under, to subordinate or make subject, and here effectively means to bury. The sonnets are invested with all of Shakespeare's spirit, ideas, and memories, which he has assumed to be dead once he's committed them to ink on paper. In the original text, 
Rains is spelled R-A-I-G-N-E-S, which might be an attempt to conflate rules over with the idea of rainfall. Love reigns in both senses, and this also relates to the next quatrain's tears. Out of more than 200 uses of the word love in the sonnets, this is the first time it's been capitalized. Sonnets 153 and 154 make it seem like it's referencing Cupid, the god of love. This is in line with its use in Golding's translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses, which, as discussed before, was one of Shakespeare's prime sources for both the sonnets and his plays. The numbers of the other sonnets can be found in the description of this episode. Tracing the use of the word parts in Golding's Metamorphoses, we can see that love's loving parts can refer to body parts, specifically genitalia, but also parts of a day, location, as in around these parts, parting farewells, roles in a play, and the parts of man invested with the spirit of God as opposed to those made from the earth. It's also possibly musical parts or fractions. Of course, in the context of the sonnet sequence, each sonnet is a part of the sequence as a whole. I mentioned the blason, the technique of separating the object of the poet's affections into its parts. When discussing sonnet 17, when we encounter the expression, shows not half your parts. Here, in sonnet 31, the first thing we encounter is thy bosom, a deconstruction into body parts regardless of whose body parts they may be, and the first quatrain may well be somehow referencing the Shakespeare coat of arms. Friends which I thought dead can be read in two ways. Friends which I thought were buried, and friends which I dreamed up are buried. In the first quatrain, Shakespeare is telling the sonnets that they have been made precious with the infusion of his spirit, and aspects of all those people that he has loved and lost. Which I by lacking have supposed dead can be read as, which are effectively dead to me because we've lost touch, but also as, who have died because of something lacking in me, which could be referring to the circumstances surrounding Hamnet's death and a number of appearances of guilt in the previous sonnets. Love, or Cupid, is the ruler of the world of the sonnet sequence, and is supported by all the loving parts and buried friends that may well be the characters and roles that are portrayed in the sonnets, and possibly even in his plays. From the sonnet's point of view, Shakespeare's bosom contains all of his loved ones and his creations, and as the sonnets are not able to communicate with them directly, they can only be assumed to be dead. It is in Shakespeare that all of these entities reign. Through the reading of the sonnets, Shakespeare is able to resurrect himself, his love, and all he holds dear in the bosom of the reader, where they will reside and rule the reader's mind for the duration of the reading experience. How many a holy and obsequious tear hath dear religious love stolen from mine eye, as interest of the dead which now appear, but things removed that hidden in there lie. As counting is a theme and a puzzle for the reader throughout the sonnet sequence, line 5's suggestion to count the tears is interesting. Holy meant holy, consecrated, sacred, godly, ecclesiastical, as we're familiar with today, but also whole or intact, that cannot be transgressed or violated, and related to health, happiness, and good luck. Obsequious, according to the Arden sonnets, can be understood as relating to a funeral. It also means prompt to serve, meekly compliant with the will or wishes of another, dutiful, and by Shakespeare's day had already developed its pejorative sense of fawning, sycophantic, or unduly compliant. Tear can be read both as fluid drop from the eye, from the Old English tear, drop, nectar, and what is distilled in drops, as well as tear, the act of ripping or rending, or what has been torn. In French, tear means third, which may be related, and the English tier, meaning row, rank, or range, derived from the Old French tir, meaning rank, sequence, order, kind, and also likeness, image, state, or condition, ties in strongly to the images referenced in this sonnet and sonnet 24, as well as the sequence counting referenced often in the sonnets. Religious, as it does today, meant devout, 
pious, imbued with or expressive of religious devotion. The word stolen interests me because historically it relates as much to the notion of stealth as it does to robbery. I, as I've pointed out many times before, serves as metonymy for the sonnet window into Shakespeare's soul. Interest here suggests the interest of a loan, tying into the established lending theme, as well as legal claim or right, a concern, a benefit, advantage, a being concerned or affected from the old French meaning damage, loss, or harm. Dead here appears to be the dead referred to in the first quatrain, as opposed to its more general sense. To quote from the previous episode, the Old English origins of the word thing relate to both the legal theme, meeting, assembly, council, discussion, and the idea of the sonnets being creations and agents of their author in act, deed, event, material object, body, being, or creature. Removed can be read both as taken away and distanced from or departed. Hidden means concealed, but could also imply covered in animal hide, which would suggest the covering of the book of the sonnet sequence. Lie can be both rest in a horizontal position and deceive. Shakespeare's tears for his lost son have been paid to the sonnets, tears of ink that have been stolen from the bard and buried within the sequence. We can also read that Shakespeare has cried tears for the loss of his sonnets as they depart on their journey into the future, and every tear that his sonnets successfully steal from a reader's eyes will be paying Shakespeare back interest for his investment in the sonnets. Thou art the grave where buried love doth live, hung with the trophies of my lovers gone, who all their parts of me to thee did give, that due of many now is thine alone. Trophies, spoils or prizes of war, derives from Latin's a sign of victory or monument. Shakespeare and his sonnets are graves where buried love, Hamnet and his father respectively, live eternally. Whether lovers refers to the real people he's loved, characters in his plays, or the previous sonnets in the sequence, Shakespeare infuses his memories of them into the sonnet sequence and once buried there, they belong to the sequence and no one else. If the sonnet is referring to its predecessors as My Love Is Gone, then it is saying that the sonnets, which should be made available to the public, have wholly dedicated themselves to Shakespeare and, while Shakespeare is alive and writing the rest of the sequence, belong to him alone. If the third quatrain is read as speaking to the reader, the sonnets are assumed to have been passed on from reader to reader until they arrive in the current reader's hands at which point they belong to them and them alone. Their images I loved, I view in thee, and thou, or they, hast all the all of me. Just as suggested in Sonnet 24, Shakespeare has painted images of himself and his loved ones into the sonnets. He sees them when he writes the sonnets, and when he reviews the sonnets, and he has dedicated himself to their memories. Similarly, when the reader reads a sonnet, they conjure up the images that Shakespeare has concealed within the poetry, and at least for the duration of the reading will be consumed by those memories. The sonnets, who are inert until brought to life by the reader, see and hear these memories as they are recited by the reader, and in that moment belong to the reader in every sense. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording this podcast, converting these podcast episodes into a book, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, I need your help to make this happen. Please consider signing up to support this project at www.patreon.com slash fisherking, and keep up to date with the graphic novel progress at sonnetcomics.com with an X, Facebook, Minds.com, Twitter, Instagram, or Reddit. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like the others? others. 
What am I saying? I'm not just another no. one in your place. You're the pretender. What am I saying? I will never surrender.